You know, I think this may be the only game ever made where leaving a hostile location earns you hit points. And we're not talking small amounts either, this is actually the preferred method of building up a stock of HP. So, I need you guys to put yourself in my shoes for a moment. I've gone my entire life, up to now, without playing any of the Ultima games. My knowledge of them basically stemmed down to the style of gameplay seen in other derivative titles like Excelsior. And in all honesty, the reason I never played any of them is simply that I never got around to them. So imagine my surprise when I played today's ancient DOS game, Ultima 1, The First Age of Darkness, and discovered that it's actually more than just the progenitor of an entire style of RPGs, as it also has 3D dungeons, time travel, and something else which we'll get into later that can just completely blew my mind. The game is showing its age to an extreme degree though. Back when it was new, it was likely challenging and tricky to play, but nowadays, thanks to more modern gaming sensibilities, playing this game mostly comes down to just a bunch of grinding and boom, you're done. It isn't challenging in the slightest by today's standards, and the story elements are extremely minimal. The mechanics are also extremely easy to take advantage of, and once you start speeding through this thing, much of the creative aspects get lost to the grind, and you stop paying attention to the things which made this game impressive for when it first came out. Ultima originally came out as an Apple II game in 1981 making it one of the oldest games I've ever covered. Even though technically this DOS port was released by Origin Systems in 1987. Although some of the ports came out in 86 as well. Ultima was originally conceived by Richard Garriott, also known colloquially as Lord British, a name he got in grade school cause the other kids thought he had a British accent. Ultima is a one player role playing game with support for CGA 4 color, Tandy 16 color, and EGA 16 color graphics, with the Tandian EGA 320x216 color modes looking the best. It also supports the PC speaker for sound effects, though unless you play the game at a very slow pace, they can be kind of difficult to make out. As for its current release date, the game's still commercial even after all these years, and is readily available from the good old game's website at www.gog.com as a trilogy of the first three Ultima games for $6. Just keep in mind though that the GOG release of the game is missing some of the supplemental materials necessary for understanding how to play the game. Well, okay, it does include a digital copy of the game's manual, but the manual only covers the game in general without delving into specific topics like keyboard controls and such. As for finding physical copies, all I can say is good freaking luck. The name alone makes finding copies exceptionally difficult, combined with the added difficulty of spin-off games bearing the Ultima name getting in the way. Not to mention, because the game came out for so many different platforms, finding a specific version would probably be extraordinarily difficult. Basically, if you're looking for this game for sake of collecting, be warned, you're likely going to be looking for quite a while. Since this is an RPG, you might be expecting this grand story, but it's actually a very simple story when it comes down to it. The game takes place on a world known as Cesaria, split into four regions with similar geographical features, but arranged and varied in slightly different ways, each region under control of two lords. However, the lords are held under the evil gaze of the wizard Mondane, who a thousand years ago created a gem which granted him immortality. In his immortal state, he created beasts and monsters to terrorize Cesaria and reign control over everyone. The only way to break the cycle of evil is to travel back in time and destroy Mondane before he can finish making his gem. Easier said than done though, since you first have to find a time machine, and you can't find a time machine without rescuing a princess, but the princesses of the land only reveal the location to those they deem worthy through their experience and deeds, so yeah, better get ready for grind time. 
Before you begin playing, you create a character with six primary attributes. Strength, Stamina, Agility, Charisma, Wisdom, and Intelligence. I'm not entirely certain what effects these stats have, and I can tell you right now, they're not as clear-cut as you may think. For instance, Intelligence affects how well you can haggle people in town, thus reducing the price of goods, while Charisma only affects how much you can sell things for. Wisdom, I believe, affects trap disarming, and I'm fairly certain strength affects either the damage you inflict or how often your attacks hit. Stamina and agility I was never able to figure out, though, and the manual doesn't say anything about them. You also choose a race, a gender, and a character class. Though this simply gives you bonuses to certain stats, though the choice between male and female has virtually no effect on how the game plays out, at least as far as I can tell. One point of interest is that one of the races is called a Bobbit, obviously an analogy to the hobbits found in Tolkien lore. The gameplay itself is fairly simple, albeit somewhat overcomplicated at times. You move around with the arrow keys and have a slew of letter keys to perform actions, many of which could have been condensed into a single button. Now, this was a trope of early RPGs and even adventure titles to try to make them feel more engaging by having all these different actions even if most objects in the world only have one action applied to them at any point in time. For instance, you use the B key to board objects, like horses and rafts, but you use the X key to exit off of them. So you essentially have two different keys to directly affect one state. You also find coffins and chests while walking through dungeons, but you press O to open the coffins and U to unlock the chests. I've also noticed that there's no diagonal movement buttons, even though enemies are able to attack and move diagonally. Either this is an oversight, or I simply couldn't find the right buttons to push. At the bottom of the screen is a window to show messages relating to the actions that you've performed, and in the bottom right corner are your active stats. Specifically, hit points, food, experience, and coins. If you run out of either hit points or food, you die, so keeping both of those numbers up is important. Hit points are only lost in battle, but food is lost as a factor of movement. Moving around outdoors in the overworld will consume the most food, while traveling around in dungeons and towns is far less demanding on your food levels. Having a mode of transportation other than your feet also helps reduce food usage. Experience builds up as you defeat more and more monsters and affects your experience level, which doesn't affect your stats in any way and is simply one of the requirements towards reaching the end of the game. Coins are money, which you will use to buy stuff in towns. Towns are where you'll go to buy weapons, armor, spells, food, and new transportation. Though there's also castles for the lords of each section of the world. Well, there's little to do in those places short of going on quests or rescuing princesses. Early on, rescuing princesses is a bad idea because of how dangerous the guards are, but later on this can actually be a good source of hit points and money. Not to mention once you have the necessary rank, you need to do this to learn where the time machine is. Going on quest is important because it's the only way to raise your strength attribute, as all other attributes are raised through special locations found throughout the world marked by signposts. Now here's one of the tricks to the signpost locations. Whatever benefit they give you, they won't give you again until after you visit another signpost. So basically, you can max out two of your stats really quickly if you just go back and forth between two signs. Signs which don't provide you with benefits anymore will still function in this as well. There's also a particular sign which will give you weapons, all the way up to the most powerful in the game. Suffice to say, once you have the transportation necessary to travel to all these signs, you'll probably want to grind them out and just get them out of the way. Though the charisma of a stowing sign can mostly be avoided since you really don't do a lot of item selling in this game. The best way to build up your HP and money though is by dungeon crawling. When you enter a dungeon, the game goes into a 3D perspective, where the arrow keys now act as moving forwards, turning left or right, or looking behind you. Given how sparse everything is and how deep these dungeons get, you're probably thinking you're going to need to start drawing maps or something. However, there's a couple aspects of these dungeons which make them very easy to navigate without going to such extremes. Firstly, each dungeon floor is only 9x9 spaces big, so that alone limits just how much traveling you're going to do on each floor. The other thing though is that each floor is made up of 5 long corridors connected on the sides by double doors or blocked off by magic barriers. This effectively makes half of every floor nothing more than transitionary stuff, so learning the layout of a floor is a piece of cake. 
Besides, going deep into a dungeon without a healthy supply of ladder up spells is a really bad idea. Now, spellcasting in this game is similar to a scrolls based system, meaning each time you buy a spell, you're only buying a single use of that spell. To get multiple uses, you have to buy the spell multiple times. And besides which, there's few reasons to go beyond the first floor of a dungeon, save for beating quests, especially since when you leave a dungeon, the more enemies you destroyed prior, the more hit points you'll get for the trouble. Now, if you do delve deep into a dungeon, though, keep in mind that once you get to the third floor, the power of the enemies skyrockets. Attempting to go deep into a dungeon without over a thousand hit points at the very least is suicide. Though, speaking of skyrocketing, let's go blast off in a space shuttle. Wait, what? So this one came entirely out of left field. Apparently, one of the prerequisites to getting directions to the time machine is to become an ace. This can't be done through normal gameplay. Instead, you need to gain the experience and money necessary to be offered the purchase of shuttles at the transportation shops, then head into outer space, a process referred to as star walking, in order to do battle with TIE fighters from a first person view. Yeah, this is really happening right now. However, while going up into space may seem like a fun thing to do, there's a massive number of things that can go wrong for the inexperienced. So let's get some guidelines out of the way, which will keep you from losing massive amounts of progress. Firstly, you can't save while you're in space, so make sure to save prior to liftoff. Secondly, the shuttle you launch in has very limited stats, so you'll want to switch to a more powerful ship docked at a starbase. But it costs 500 coins to do this, and the only kind of ships which can safely land back on the planet are those shuttles. Meaning it's going to cost another 500 coins to switch back to a shuttle once you can. So heading up into space without a minimum of a thousand extra coins is again likely going to get you killed or left in limbo. The other thing you have to be careful of is how much fuel you have left. Every action you perform in space consumes fuel. Hyper jumps into nearby sectors consume the most, while your lasers consume quite a large amount as well. If you run out of fuel in the middle of combat, you'll likely get destroyed by the enemy craft. If you run out of fuel in a peaceful area, you'll just float endlessly, unable to do anything, potentially being stuck in limbo forever. A general rule of thumb is not to enter a hostile sector unless you have at least a thousand fuel remaining, and head back to a starbase or the planet if you drop below 700-ish, avoiding any hostile sectors along the way. You can use the game's information screen to view the sector chart which will indicate where the suns are, where the hostile targets are, and where the space stations are. Keep in mind though that not every space station has stuff docked at it, and you still need to have a healthy amount of money on hand to take advantage of them. Overall, Ultima 1 is a weird, yet innovative game. For when it came out, there were very few computer role-playing games to begin with, so Richard Garriott really was charting unknown territory with this stuff. Many of the mechanics are odd, but easy enough to get used to and ultimately abuse for your own benefit, which is why the game really isn't all that difficult, just grindy. It's a fun play if you've never played it before, but given the kinds of games we have nowadays, it won't take long before you either get bored or beat the game. It's an interesting play for sure if you want to experience the start of the role-playing genre, but it's certainly not something you'll go back to over and over again. Nor would I say it's really necessary to play this thing. RPGs have come a huge way since this game first debuted over three decades ago, and this does more of a curiosity nowadays than something worth sinking hours of gameplay into. Of course, don't forget that the Ultima series consists of several titles and spin-offs as well. So despite being outdated, many of those titles wouldn't exist if this one was never made. In terms of DOSBox, just leave Cycle set to auto and you should be good to go. But keep in mind that the game was designed for slower systems, and the PC speaker sound effects won't be right unless you set a low fixed cycles count. Doing this though slows the game down and makes it take longer to play, which is why I feel having the higher speed is a better idea. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next Saturday for episode 172, we're going to be taking a look at another pinball title. But unlike the ones I've looked at up to now, this one's considered to be one of the worst. And since I've never played it before, I don't know how accurate that assessment is. So we're going to find out together. 
Of course, make sure to send your guests to ADG at pixelships.com and make sure to stay tuned to find out just how bad or good this thing is.